Ahoy crew, and welcome back to the Maritime History Podcast. Today, we tackle episode 36, part one of our look at the Naval Battle of Artemisium. The title, of course, gives it away for the episode here today. And to start us out, I'm going to read a prophecy that may or may not sound familiar to you, but I think it helps us set the stage well for our episode today and for the next few episodes on deck as well. Now, this prophecy is relayed to us through the writings of Herodotus, surprise, surprise, and here it is. Athena cannot mollify the power of Olympian Zeus, although she begs him with all her eloquence and subtlety, and yet, this word I give you, adamant, a promise. Everything within the borders of Attica shall fall, yes, and the sacred vales of nearby mountains, but the wooden wall alone, the wooden wall shall stand. That much Zeus grants to Athena, as an aid to you and all your children. Men on horses, men on foot, sweeping, they come from Asia. Retreat, for soon enough you will meet with them face to face. Divine Salamis, you will be the ruin of many a mother's son, when the seed is scattered or the harvest is gathered in. This prophecy was the cryptic words that were delivered to the leaders of Athens by the uttered vision of the Delphic Oracle in the spring of 480 BCE. Xerxes and his armed thousands had crossed the pontoon bridges that spanned the Hellespont only weeks before, bringing the force of their arms to bear on Europe at last. In our previous episode, we saw how a small minority of Greek city-states had attempted to win allies to their cause from abroad, but just as they failed to recruit the powerful ruler Galon of Sicily, they failed to recruit most others to their cause as well. The few but powerful city-states who were staunch in their opposition to the Persians finally convened a congress at the Isthmus of Corinth to decide the next steps that they would take. Although the Persians hadn't yet neared Greece proper, or even neared Macedonia, the Greek city-states were wise to try to plan ahead for once. At this congress, what they agreed on was to attempt a blockade of a mountain pass in northern Greece, a pass called Tempe. Representatives from Thessaly, which was the region where Tempe was located, they said that it was the only mountain pass in this region, and they claimed that it was one that Persia would have to pass through, and therefore one that could be blocked up to prevent Persia from continuing south and reaching Greece proper, especially Attica. Now, this plan sounded great to the Greek Congress, but after Themistocles and many of the other leaders assented to carry on with this plan, they assembled 10,000 soldiers and they sailed all the way north and dropped the soldiers off near this pass of Tempe. Well, after they'd done all that, they discovered that, in fact, Tempe was not the only passage through the mountains. There were other routes. They also discovered that other cities in this region had already Medized, or pledged allegiance to Persia, so they would just give Persia a free pass to carry on southward as they pleased. So much for that idea, basically. But at least Themistocles did pull the plug on it before things had progressed too far, before Persia had actually showed up. This abortive plan could have ended the Greek resistance before it had really even begun. It's possible, though, that this non-starter adventure to Tempe and back may have given Themistocles a bit of inspiration for a plan that comes into play for the Greeks later. So keep that in mind, and we'll return to it in a bit. It was after this debacle at Tempe that Athens sent her envoys up to visit the oracle at Delphi, 
And it was then and there that they received the prophecy that we opened the episode with. Now, I personally am intrigued by the theories that you've probably heard of. They're tossed around regarding the oracle and how the prophecies were typically passed down. Um, there's these ideas about how hallucinogenic vapors may have played a role in the oracle's um, ability to give the prophecies. That's interesting. There's also some interesting discussion about how the oracle and the temple religions fit into Greek society and the social role that religion plays. That's all interesting to me, but those are, as usual, off-topic for our purposes today. What I will say is that the prophecy about Salamis and the wooden walls was actually the second prophecy that the oracle had uttered to the Greeks that day. The first one was what you might call a prophecy of doom and gloom. It included lines like, quote, To the ends of the land you should flee and, quote, into the devouring fire will Ares give the temples of eternal gods. The first prophecy ended with the uplifting line, quote, now step out of the shrine and shroud over your heart with the evils to come. But, as we've said, the Greeks entered the shrine a second time, and they received this second prophecy that wasn't really rosy, I suppose, but it at least left a vague whiff of hope in the air for them to grasp at, and um, it was a little more rosy than the first prophecy. As all prophecies tend to be, it was literally vague as well, though, enough so that when the Greeks departed, they brought the two prophecies before the assembly the assembly immediately began to debate about what these prophecies meant and, consequently, what course of action should be taken as a result of what meaning was pulled from the prophecies. You might be able to guess, two main camps sprung up in the debate, and I hesitate to say it yet again, but um, that's really how these things tend to go, typically. One camp felt that the second prophecy meant that the Acropolis would be preserved, and that Greece would somehow emerge victorious by defending the city with a force of arms. This first camp seized on the phrase that, quote, the wooden wall alone shall stand, and they spun this phrase to mean that the Acropolis would be saved, since in ancient times the Acropolis had been enclosed by a thorn hedge, which they then took to mean a wooden wall. Now, this seems like a bit of a stretch, but then again, the interpretation of the second camp does also seem as a stretch, too, when it's taken at face value. This second camp was led by none other than Themistocles, and his spin on the wooden walls prophecy was that it referred to the navy of ships that Athens had concluded building in the winter just past. Ships are, of course, made of wood, and they could resemble a wall if they were lined up in a battle formation, right? Now, the catch with this interpretation was that Athens herself would not stand. So, if the wooden walls theory applied to ships, that means that the city would have to be abandoned entirely in order to put every last drop of Athenian strength into manning her wooden wall, so to speak. Now, the first camp that backed a armed defense of Athens, they were a little bit confused by the line that made reference to Salamis, the one that said, quote, Divine Salamis, you will be the ruin of many a mother's son when the seed is scattered or the harvest is gathered in. This first camp assumed that the interpretation alluded to a Greek defeat at Salamis, with its reference to destruction. Themistocles, though, really strengthened the argument coming from his side of the camp 
and really that's been a theme that we've seen, he had his own perspective and we can appreciate it as that of a wily politician slash lawyer with a knack for turning any situation to his own uses. His response to this line about Salamis in the prophecy was that if it really meant that the Greeks would be defeated, then it should have been worded with harsher language. It should have said something like, O Salamis cruel, and not O Salamis divine. After all, how could Salamis be described as divine if the Greeks were destined to falter there? So Themistocles again won the day, and he inspired the Athenian assembly to adopt his approach, the approach which viewed the wooden wall as being the navy. Therefore, the city would be abandoned to the Persians, and the Greeks would trust entirely in their wooden wall of mighty triremes. Convincing his fellow Athenians to back this plan was only the first hurdle for Themistocles. He then rejoined the Allied Congress that had aligned with the Athenian cause, and then he had to convince them to also back his plan. Without the cooperation of the few allies that Athens had managed to cobble together, no Athenian plan stood a chance of success, whether it was launched by land or by sea. Perhaps it was because they had already been convinced of the Persian threat and were clear on the relative strengths and weaknesses that each city-state brought to the table. Whatever the reason, the allied Greek city-states were rather quick to reach an agreement about their next course of action. This earlier attempt to stop up the pass at Tempe was a failure. They all saw that now. But it was a failure only because of factors outside the Alliance's knowledge or control. The basic strategy of mounting a forward defense in the north of Greece, this was still a valid strategy and one that might not see the Greeks defeat Persia outright, but it would buy them enough time to evacuate Athens and to react to events as they developed. The piece of strategy that Themistocles may have picked up from the failed attempt at Tempe was, well, really, it was probably this idea that a solely land-based defense would not be good enough to be effective. It really didn't make sense at all to put all of your eggs in a land defense basket, since the Persians did have a huge navy and they could just sail around Tempe or whatever other pass, and they could land armed forces to the south and attack the defenders at the pass from both sides. Now, the fact that Persia could easily do this was probably known to Themistocles. It's not fair to say that he didn't realize this when they made the plan to try to stop up the pass at Tempe. We are told, after all, that 10,000 soldiers that were dedicated to that task, they were sailed north and then marched across land to Tempe. So the ships were up there. They could easily have been manned, and maybe it's just not in the text. It stands to reason that the Greek ships would have coordinated with the defense there, but perhaps we're just not told anything about it or anything about such a plan in the historical texts that we have. Anyways, when it comes to their second and the ultimately final plan, we are told plenty about the coordination that was planned between the land and the naval forces. So let's go ahead now and get into the nitty gritty of Thermopylae and Artemisium. Thermopylae is one of the most recognizable names in battles from the ancient Greek world, as you no doubt already know. The name Thermopylae derives from two separate words that mean something like the hot gates, when combined. Thermos means hot, and pylai was the plural form of the word which means gate, but this word also encompassed regions like what this one Thermopylae was, it was a mountain pass that was effectively a gateway 
from northern Greece down into southern Greece, or vice versa, depending which way you're traveling. Given that the Spartans were part of the Greek alliance, they took the meat of the earlier aborted plan to stopper up the pass at Tempe, and they applied it to a new strategy. Sparta was, of course, the source of some of the ancient world's most effective soldiers, and using these soldiers along with a contingent of many other soldiers from other city-states, they would stop up the hot gates, and this time they were positive that Persia's massive army would have no other choice but to march through the pass at Thermopylae if they were aiming to destroy Athens. Alas, a lot of the discussion about the 300 Spartans, about the land strategy, and the related issues there, it's, again, superfluous to requirements for our maritime-centric discussion. So, with that in mind, let's move to consider the second piece to this coordinated Greek strategy. As we said, if only the Spartans and the other Greek hoplites who took part in blocking up Thermopylae if they were the only piece to the puzzle, then the Persians could have easily sailed around them and attacked from behind. Themistocles foresaw this possibility, I'm sure other Greek leaders did as well, and that's where the naval strategy became crucial for the allied Greeks. We'll get into the details, especially the details of Artemisium, before we do that, we need to lay the outline of the geographical layout a little bit, as well as the relative states of the Greek and Persian navies prior and leading up to this battle, so we get an idea of where the battle took place and who was taking part in it. Let's take the geography first. As usual, this is a little hard to describe when a map is so much more useful in illustrating the points at hand. I have started dabbling into creating some unique maps for the podcast to use. I have the first one up on the show notes for this episode, and it's in pretty high resolution, so I think that might be helpful, because a lot of maps that you'll see for history-related discussion online, terrible resolution, they're full of useless data and things that aren't relevant to the point at hand, so I tried to pare it down so it's useful for this discussion about the naval battle at Artemisium. That all being said, let's get to the geography now. In the broadest terms, the Persian navy was sailing from the north, following the coastlines around the northern Aegean, reaching ever closer to Athens. They, of course, dug that massive canal to help them bypass Mount Athos, but the Greeks had settled on their unified strategy in the spring of 480, and by July of that year, the Persians had still not come knocking. Rumor was filtering down from the north, and if Herodotus is to be believed, some of these rumors centered on the size of the Persian army being so enormous that they were drinking dry the rivers of Macedonia. Regardless, it was in August 480 that more concrete news reached the Greek confederation. The Persians were on the move at last, and it was time for the Greek strategy to be put in motion. Persia was heading north to south, which of course means that the Greek defense was working in the opposite direction generally. We made enough of the fact that the Greek strategy was a two-part defense that you might think the land forces and the naval forces were set up close to one another. In some other spot, that may have been the setup, but Thermopylae is actually 40 miles separated from Artemisium, the site where the Greek navy would ultimately establish its base of operations. Now, there are a lot of considerations that go into choosing an appropriate battle site, so let's consider a couple of them. Geography is, again, the first factor to consider here. The Greeks, and it would seem that probably Themistocles in particular, really did pick the best possible defensive position that they could have, and most of that is down to the defensibility of the mountain pass at Thermopylae, 
combined with the prime naval position that they took up by making Artemisium their base. Artemisium is located on the northern tip of the island of Euboea. Um, we've talked about this island a bit already, and I'll just say that Artemisium is today a city at the northern tip of this island, but it's also kind of the region as a whole and um, the name of the beaches, the pristine beaches at the northern end of this island as well. Now, it's quite meaningful that Euboea is an island, since by making Artemisium their base, the Greeks could lay in wait and react to the Persian approach. Euboea's eastern coast was long, windswept, and rather dangerous to sailors. Maybe the Persians knew that, and maybe they didn't. The Greeks could wait at Artemisium and see if Persia made a break that way, and they could easily engage them before they reached Athens. It was, though, more likely that the Persian navy would take the western route around Euboea, since that route kept them closer to the army and it was more sheltered. This route was narrow, since Euboea lay pretty close to mainland Greece. At points, taking this route is like sailing through a narrow channel. There's not much clearance between the island and the mainland. So, in the end, Themistocles set up the Greek base at Artemisium with the plan of engaging the Persians off the coast of Artemisium, but if they chose to avoid conflict with Greece there, the Greek fleet could adapt and react by going around Euboea in either direction. The naval engagement coordinated with the stand at Thermopylae was pretty much a delaying measure. To slow down the Persian advance, but also to give the Greeks more time to see what exactly they were up against and to flesh out a plan for defending Athens and the rest of southern Greece. The other geographic reason that Artemisium was important is one that we pointed out earlier, and that is that it allowed the Greek navy to keep Persia's ships from sailing in behind the Spartans at Thermopylae and dropping off soldiers to attack the pass from the rear. Take a look at that map again, but you'll see that Thermopylae is um, perfectly defensible when you have a navy set up at Artemisium to cut off the Persian fleet and um, to cut them off in either direction that they might approach. That all as it is, there were more localized reasons that Artemisium was an important site for the Greeks to have seized control of first. The main reason here is that Artemisium was by far the best harbor in this region. It allowed plenty of space for the Greek fleet to beach their triremes as they awaited the arrival of their foes. And this, of course, brings up the point that ancient navies like this they didn't set up naval blockades the way that most of us think of them um, if we're thinking about modern or even age of sail naval tactics. The trireme wasn't really built to sustain long periods of time in the water. The ships would get waterlogged, they would grow heavier, which would affect maneuverability. Additionally, the ship wasn't built to carry large stores of food or water, for the enormous crew of rowers that would be present on a fully manned trireme ready for battle. The typical approach then was to beach a trireme every night if possible, to let the hull dry out, to let the crew get off their rowing benches and rest and eat and drink. This was crucial when the speed and the power of your ships was ultimately based on the physical state and the stamina of your men, because arm strength really did power these missiles of the Greek navy. So then, Artemisium was a prime naval base for the Greek fleet, although there is an argument to be made that it was a bit far to the north of any territory that they were really intimately familiar with, it could have left them very exposed if the battle against Persia were to go poorly, but I suppose, I mean, all things considered, 
the plan that they came up with to do this two-pronged defensive stand at Artemisium and Thermopylae is probably one of the best plans they could have come up with given the circumstances. It's one of the better options they had because it gave them the beginnings of a chance to defend themselves against Persia, to delay the Persian army, and to live to fight another day. But the main problem for them was in the comparative size of their fleet against the Persian fleet. Now, taking the figures that we read in Herodotus as they are, and I know that's a very different topic of debate, I'm thinking I'll probably devote a member episode to a discussion about the debate between the sizes of the Greek and Persian navies, if they really could have been as large as Herodotus or other historians from ancient times claim. Anyway, taking Herodotus at face value, the Greek confederation had only managed to cobble together 271 triremes by August of 480. It's a respectable number, given the reality that Athens herself contributed 180 triremes and had built the vast majority of those ships in the year or so leading up to the Persian invasion. Corinth also contributed 40 triremes, and a smattering of other city-states brought smaller numbers of ships. It's really still mind-boggling to me to think that of the hundreds of Greek city-states and colonies, only 31 of them joined the confederation to resist Persia. Believe it or not, more Greek city-states fought on Persia's side. Persia's navy was a hodgepodge of ships from various cities and regions, and it's clear from the numbers given to us by Herodotus that the number of ships in the Persian navy that came or were contributed by Ionian or other Greek cities or Greek-related cities, the ships coming from this subset of places were greater in number than the entire Greek alliance's navy. The Greek-related ships that were in Persia's navy outnumbered the entire Greek allied navy. That's just a staggering thought to me, especially given the things that we're going to see coming up here. Now, there's not much historical dispute about whether the size of the Greek navy was accurately depicted in the ancient sources, but the size of the Persian navy and army is heavily disputed, and it has been for a very long time. Taking Herodotus at face value again, we see the figure of 1,207 triremes when the Persian navy set sail toward Greece. As we said, this fleet was a mishmash fleet. 300 ships were from Phoenicia, 200 from Egypt, 150 from Cyprus, a hundred from Cilicia, various other regions of the Near East as well. Then the Ionian Greek cities contributed 100 ships, the Eastern Greek islands about 17, Aeolian Greece 60 ships, and then as the fleet sailed west following the coasts, they picked up about another 120 ships from the predominantly Greek islands and regions that made up the northern Aegean. So, in total, Greek ships in the Persian navy numbered about 300, probably more than that, which is essentially, as we said, equal or greater to the size of the allied Greek navy as it was at Artemisium in August 480. As I said, though, the actual size of Persia's navy is where controversy centers, it's a little more complex than I really want to get into today, but the elevator pitch version is that the Persian Empire simply could not have conscripted enough men to comprise the land forces and the rowers necessary to man the rowing benches of 1,300 triremes, not to mention other ships that aren't even numbered in the source material. Many modern scholars revise the fleet size down some cut it in half and say that the Persian navy could only have numbered 600. I tend to think that it's feasible for their fleet to have been toward the larger end, 
even if it wasn't literally the 1207 ships that Herodotus claims it was. There's also the possibility that the Persian fleet was indeed 1207 ships, but that they only partly manned the rowing benches, which would of course have hampered the tactical capabilities of their fleet. That's a discussion that we'll get into, especially when we discuss Salamis in greater detail, but we'll probably get into it on our next episode about Artemisium as well. For the purposes of consistency and clarity, I'm going to stick with the numbers from Herodotus and Aeschylus today, and moving forward when we talk about these naval battles. Be all that discussion as it may, we find ourselves now in late summer in the Aegean in 480 BCE. The Greek allies have heard enough rumor filtering from the north to confirm in their minds that Persia's forces are indeed somewhere to the north in the region of Macedonia. The fleet advances alongside the armed forces, hugging the unfamiliar coastline. The Greek fleet, as we've said, arrived sometime in early August, and they chose to seize the best harbor. Their ships were beached along the welcoming flat beaches around Artemisium, where they could await the Persian fleet and force them to make the first move. Meanwhile, Leonidas and his 300 Spartans, along with a healthy contingent of several thousand other soldiers from allied Greek city-states, they had taken up their predecided position at the hot gates, awaiting the arrival of the Persian land forces to be signified by the approach of a thunderous march. Much as the land forces sent ahead forward scouts, the Greek fleet sent three ships north from Artemisium to keep a lookout. Granted, they weren't sent that far north of the main fleet. They had sailed just to the island of Skiathos, which lies off the southern tip of Magnesia, which is the inhospitable stretch of coastline down which the Persian fleet would have to sail as they came from those regions further north. Skiathos was just across what we can call the Artemisium Channel, only 15 miles northeast from where the Greek navy was stationed on the beaches. But this was far enough away that the Greeks set up a signal fire on the mountains of the island to help alert the main fleet at Artemisium to when the Persian ships had sailed into view. Good old-fashioned mountaintop signal fires. And I can't help but think of the Lord of the Rings scene where Pippin lights the signal fire of Minas Tirith to set off the chain reaction of the Seven Beacons, which would call for the aid of Rohan. Good times. And for the record, let's just not get into the whole discussion about the Red Arrow and how the films changed things from the books. Anyway, let's not bother with it right now, but do feel free to hit me up on Twitter or email, however else, if you like, and I'll talk Lord of the Rings with you anytime. For today, though, let's get back to those three Greek ships at Skiathos, ready to give the signal to light the beacon. They waited, and they waited, as watchmen aboard watch ships tend to do. And then, perhaps when they least expected it, ten ships came darting over the northern horizon. I say perhaps they didn't expect it, because what happens next is a bit perplexing if they did expect it. Although these scout ships were sent to Skiathos expressly to keep their eyes peeled, they were caught off guard by these ten ships, and chaos ensued. One ship from the Greek city of Troizen was quickly captured by ships that we read were ten of Persia's best ships. Herodotus says that the barbarians took the, quote, most handsome marine to the prow of the ship and cut his throat, securing a good omen to themselves. The second Greek watch ship, this one from Aegina, put up a bit more of a fight, 
struggling to evade the speed of the Persian fleet's fastest ships. The Aegean ship was captured too, though, but her bravest soldier so impressed the Persians that they spared him out of respect. The third scout ship was an Athenian ship, and although this one slipped through the grasp of the Persian scouts, it only made it to a nearby shore, and there the men aboard abandoned their trireme, electing to march inland rather than suffer capture. All in all, then, losing your first three ships without doing any damage or even engaging the enemy, that's a bit of a bad omen in and of itself. The important thing, though, for the Greeks was that someone managed to light that signal beacon before the three ships scattered. So although they had lost these ships and were down to 330 in their force, the fleet at Artemisium now knew that Persia was within striking distance. These ten Persian scout ships had departed well ahead of the remainder of Persia's fleet. The Persian army had begun its march down to Thermopylae, but what the fleet could cover in three days, the army took almost two weeks to march. So, while the scout ships were busy embarrassing Greece's three lookout triremes, the main fleet of Persia was still at anchor in Chalkidiki to the north. We know this thanks once again to the words of Herodotus, but the Greek fleet at Artemisium did not know this at the time. Instead, we read how the Greek fleet reacted to seeing that the signal beacon was lit on the heights of Skiathos just across the channel. Despite everything we've said about their advance planning, their coordination with the forces at Thermopylae, even about the leadership abilities of Themistocles, despite all of it, when they knew that the Persians were headed straight for them, the description that Herodotus gives is one that leads us to surmise that they simply panicked. This, though, is if we take his words at face value. His words are that upon seeing the lit fire beacon, quote, they were frightened and transferred their anchorage from Artemisium to Chalcis in order to guard the Euripus, but they left lookouts on the heights of Euboea to keep watch by day. Now, there are a few intriguing possible explanations for this Greek move from their good anchorage on the beaches of Artemisium all the way to the narrow stretch of the channel between Euboea and the mainland, this area that Herodotus calls Euripus. It's one of the most narrow points of the channel. So possibility one is that the Greek fleet did indeed just panic when they thought that Persia's fleet was finally headed straight for them. This possibility, of course, flies in the face of the polished and flattering portrayal of the Greeks that we typically have in mind as we look back from a modern perspective it flies in the face of the portrayal of ancient Greece that many historians and cultures have had down through the centuries as well. But we do have to say this is the description that Herodotus gives, and it's possible that we don't need to read into it, and that he was telling the truth that the Greeks just freaked out. The Mystocles may have been a bold and visionary general over the fleet, but he often had to fight for the authority to carry out his vision, as we've seen, and Artemisia may have been no different. At this stage of things, Themistocles wasn't actually the formal commander of the Greek fleet. The Athenians had conceded that privilege to the Spartan general Eurybiades, which sounds weird, but it was Athens' way of fostering unification among the Greeks by giving command of the fleet to a Spartan general who probably didn't have too much experience commanding ships or at sea. Ultimately, everyone probably knew still that Themistocles was the one calling the shots, but I can envision a possible scenario where panic still overtook the majority that day at Artemisium and that Themistocles was just overruled during the panic of the moment 
and he was forced to adjust and make the best of a bad situation by at least keeping the fleet in Euripus and within striking distance, still having that backdoor escape route a little more handy. There's a second possible explanation, and that this one is that the Greeks did legitimately think that Persia's navy was going to head south, but that they were going to do so along the east coast, the outer coast of Euboea. There's no indication why the Greeks might have thought that. This is just pure supposition. But the Greek move to Euripus makes more sense if this was their mindset. This inner side of Euboea is more sheltered, and it would allow the Greeks to safely match Persia's southward trajectory, where they would, of course, eventually intersect down at the southern tip of the island, maybe even further towards the southern tip of Attica. This second explanation, the second possible explanation, though, has no evidence to back it up. It is pure speculation. Now to the third possibility, it's the last one we'll cover today, and I think it's one that would be the most poetic explanation if it's true. But again, it's one that we don't have too much evidence for beyond the rumors that Herodotus included in his histories. He wrote that the Athenians had, on the advice of a prophet, summoned Boreas, the god of the north wind. Now, Herodotus says he's not quite sure whether they had done this summoning before they abruptly left their anchor at Artemisium, or if they did it afterwards. So that, of course, adds two possible interpretations here. Either they fled Artemisium out of fear, and they just happened to fortuitously vacate the spot where Boreas was brewing up a monster of a storm, or, if you take the view that paints the Greeks in a kinder light, they may have seen the signs of a storm, signs that locals would have possibly been able to decipher, and they decided to ride out this storm in the more secure anchorage at Chalcis in the Euripus, and that their decision to vacate Artemisium because of the storm just happened to coincide with when these ten Persian scout ships showed up and embarrassed the Greek watch ships. The timing seems a little suspect, and the fact that Herodotus tells us the Greeks summoned up Boreas, well, you can draw your own conclusions there, I guess. Now, this generous view that they um, had seen the signs of a storm, it's logical. I mean, I can envision this being possible. And Herodotus does give a call back to the fact that the Persians had once before suffered major losses when a storm previously demolished their navy near Mount Athos. So all this talk about the Greeks fleeing Artemisium and whether or not that they knew a storm was brewing, it leaves out something rather important, and that is any consideration of the Persian fleet. We have seen how the Persian fleet remained at anchor, and they were still anchored up to the north when the Greeks fled Artemisium. The Greeks must have ended up waiting in their sheltered anchorage at Euripus for another few days at least before the signs of this storm began to manifest themselves, so that's what leads me to believe that they didn't summon the storm before they fled Artemisium. It probably was spurred by the appearance of these scout ships and the lit signal beacon. The Boreas stuff was added in later. That's my theory, but feel free to have your own. So the Greeks probably ended up waiting in Euripus for a few days because the Persian fleet was so far to the north. Where were the Persians, though, when this storm began to manifest where the Greeks could have seen it? Well, Herodotus says that the entirety of the fleet did eventually leave Chalcidice, and they had been sailing south um, for a few days, and then they made landfall along a stretch of coast in Magnesia, uh, which is a region of Greece that's north of Artemisium and across the narrow channel of water north of the island of Euboea. <laughs> 
The Persian fleet made landfall not too far from Mount Pelion, in fact. And I say they made landfall, but the reality was that Magnesia was a rather rugged stretch of coast. And the Persian fleet was unwieldily large, so all they found there was a small beach that provided negligible shelter. A fraction of their ships were able to actually make landfall, but the rest of them were forced to weigh anchor and rows spanning out from the beach, getting as close as they could, I suppose. Herodotus says that they rowed at anchor eight rows deep throughout the night, while the sailors and oarsmen snatched whatever moments of rest they could aboard a cramped ship. Now, we made reference to the fact that the Greek fleet could well have seen the signs that a storm was brewing. I think that they must have seen these after they fled Artemisium, but we'll leave open the door that they might have seen them before, and that this is why they fled Artemisium. Local knowledge of weather patterns, especially in a relatively contained and moderately sized region like the northern Mediterranean, knowledge of patterns like this were great sources to ancient peoples, so I can't imagine that the Greek navy was unaware of the storm brewing, as Herodotus describes. It's just the issue of timing that I would quibble with. Anyways, we talked in a previous episode about how even Hesiod referred to the limits of the sailing season in the Aegean, and most maritime-centric cultures in the Mediterranean knew the patterns and the rhythms of the weather, since their vessels were completely dependent on the weather and the wind. So, with all of that in mind, the thing that stands out to me in this story is that, as Herodotus tells it, the Persians didn't have any idea that a storm was in the offing. They were just sailing south, they put in for the night at a small beach, and there they were thrashed by a storm that appeared out of nowhere the next morning at dawn. I'm going to read a passage here from a great little book written by a 20th century British historian named Ernel Bradford. The book is called Thermopylae, the Battle for the West. So just from the title, you can get an idea of how he framed the conflict between Greece and Persia. Nevertheless, Mr. Bradford was a sailor himself, who spent decades in and around the Mediterranean, so I particularly value his perspective on the weather patterns and the way in which a sailor would have viewed such matters. In that vein, then, here is a passage from his book that's related to the storm we are now discussing. He writes, quote, Even though the Egyptians, for example, may have been ignorant of Aegean conditions, it's impossible that the Greeks from Ionia and the islands, or the Phoenicians who had known the sea for centuries, cannot have been aware that they were about to set out down a singularly inhospitable coast, at a time in the year when the weather is likely to become unstable. Under the Grand Chaleur of summer, all the Aegean has been gradually heating up, and it requires no more than a slight change in barometric pressure to produce an imbalance. When this happens, the hot air rises suddenly over the sea, lifting like a great balloon, and the cold air from the north roars down to replace it. The Delphic Oracle, though often misleading and confusing, was at the same time the repository of most of the knowledge, including meteorological, of its time. Pray to the winds had been the last counsel given to the seemingly doomed Greeks. So, that night, the Persians were anchored in their eight rows deep, while the Greeks prayed to Boreas to visit wrath on their enemies. Herodotus describes the following dawn as illuminating a clear and windless sky. To pick back up with Ernel Bradford, we read, quote, It was that curious bright stillness which often precedes the onset of a violent northeaster. A hellespanter was then the Greek word for it, while today it is known as the maestro, 
the master wind. It can come raging out of a cloudless sky without warning, as the hot air lifts soundless to the south. Even the modern barometer can be too slow to catch any advanced changes in the air pressure. As often as not, there are no forewarning signs, no banners of cirrus or alto stratus, nor any premonitory swell in advance of its coming. So it was on that day when the Persian fleet was getting underway and preparing to move on down the coast. Suddenly, out of the north, the wind began to pour in gale force fury. The Persian fleet was caught on a lee shore. At daybreak, disaster struck in the form of what Herodotus calls a monster storm. As you might imagine, those ships who'd drawn the long straws and been able to lodge on the beaches or weigh anchor in the very shallow water, these ships rode out the storm for the most part. But the ships in those outer rows, those ships had little to no chance. Whether they tried to stay put or whether they tried to put out to sea and get distance between themselves and the coastal hazards, many of these ships were doomed. And of course, I realize we don't know whether the Persian ships were still anchored when the storm hit or if, as Bradford describes, they had started heading south again when the storm hit. A lot of that is just up to our imagination at this point. And even the fact of whether the Greeks knew that the storm was coming or whether, as Bradford said, it hit so suddenly that not even a barometer could have predicted it, that's all down to supposition as well. To get back to the text of Herodotus, though, he says that the storm supposedly lasted three entire days, which is an interminable time for a fleet in foreign lands to have to ride out the fury of Boreas. Eventually, the prayers of the Persian Magi took effect, so to speak, and they were freed up to survey the damage. Without touching the numerical issue just yet, it's enlightening to see how Herodotus says the locals in Magnesia responded to the fate suffered by a portion of Persia's fleet. One local by the name of Ammianocles recovered a large fortune by scavenging the wrecked Persian vessels. Golden and silver cups littered the rocky shore, while he apparently even found treasure stores that had been tucked away in the holds of Persian ships. Now, undoubtedly, the trireme forces were not the only ones that had suffered in the storm. The Persian fleet had hundreds of support vessels of varying types and sizes as part of its number. So these losses hurt Persia from a wealth perspective and not just from a naval attacking strength perspective. Now, a word about the figures lost. Herodotus says that there were no fewer than 400 ships destroyed from out of the Persian fleet. Most commentaries take this number to be referring to triremes, in addition to however many auxiliary transport and treasure ships were also lost. This interpretation would mean that the Persian fleet had effectively lost one-third of its original strength to the Magnesian storm. From the size of roughly 1,300, this would have cut them down to somewhere in the range of 850 to 900 attacking ships, in addition to the support vessels. Again, as with all discussion concerning the Persian fleet's size, this number is quite subject to debate. Some scholars feel that the storm and the large number of ships that were supposedly lost in the storm was just a plot device thought up by Herodotus in order to trim the Persian fleet before they actually engaged the Greek fleet in battle. The theory there goes that the Greeks really didn't have an accurate way of gauging the size of the Persian navy, so their reports of its size were fantastically enormous. When it was en route to Greece, it got cut by one-third through the kindness of this timely Hellespanter, and well, we'll see how other events unfold before the fleet eventually reaches Salamis and the climax of this war as it occurred at sea. <laughs> 
I think I alluded earlier, I personally think that there are solid arguments to be made in support of the theory that Persia had a navy pretty close to the size that Herodotus claims, even if it may not have been precisely as large or the exact number that he claimed, I think it could feasibly have been quite close. And I do plan to go into a bit more detail on this debate in a member episode, but let's go ahead and tie a nice bow on the episode today. If you recall, when the Greek fleet hastily departed Artemisium, they left a few lookouts on the mountaintops of northern Euboea to keep an eye to the north and pass along any information that might be useful. Well, as the storm raged on, the lookouts could see enough to know that the Persian fleet had drawn nigh, but that they'd done so at the worst possible time and place. The worst time and place for the Persians, of course. When the Greek fleet received word of the Persian misfortune, they poured out libations to Poseidon, the god of the sea, and they sailed quickly back up to Artemisium. They expected there to find a bedraggled and small fleet of ships that had somehow managed to stay afloat and limp down to confront the Greek fleet that had so wisely avoided a similar fate. What they found was, at first anyway, absolutely nothing. They had beaten the Persian fleet to Artemisium Channel, which was actually good. It allowed the Greeks to retake the prime beach anchorages on the northern shores of Euboea once again. This left the shores on the opposite side of the channel to the Persians, a place that the Greeks knew as Aphitai. This name for the um, northern side of the Artemisium Channel probably derived from the Greek word aphiimai, meaning to leave or to send off. And I think it's interesting here to note that this very shoreline is the place where the legendary ship Argo was supposed to have departed with Jason and his Argonauts when they journeyed to Colchis on their quest for the Golden Fleece. No legendary heroes or foes for the Greeks in August 480, though. No, as they sat on the shores of Artemisium, what the Greek fleet instead witnessed was the gradual amassing of a naval force larger than they could have imagined. They expected a storm-tossed remnant, but over the course of a day, ship after ship rounded Magnesia and threaded through the gap between Skiathos and the mainland, headed for Aphitai, where hundreds more had already made shore. The Greek forces were at least momentarily heartened by a Persian mistake, something that's actually a bit understandable when we examine it. The Persian fleet was in unfamiliar territory, and it was comprised of ships and squadrons from many different cities and regions, all trying to assemble across the channel within view of an enemy force that was also made up of a coalition. So, the Greeks must have at least, I would think, they must have done a double take when a squadron of 15 Persian ships were clearly sailing straight for the Greek beach at Artemisium, blissfully unaware of their mistake, or so it seemed. The Greeks managed to capitalize on the Persian error, and they seized these ships before they could reroute to the correct base. So, although the conflict hadn't really begun in earnest, the Greeks had lost those three lookout ships early on, while the Persians had suffered huge losses during the storm and had now gifted the Greeks with another 15 ships that they could effectively just add to their own number. All things considered, not an altogether bad start for the Hellenic coalition. Not a bad start, but still, as they surveyed the Persian fleet only about ten miles to the north across the channel, Themistocles and his generals must have still felt uneasy. Their own ships numbered only about 300, if we're generous, and after the emotional and mental roller coaster of reaching Artemisium, fleeing, 
receiving news of the storm, returning to the beach, even capturing 15 enemy vessels without much effort at all, Themistocles stood at Artemisium, and he could see a Persian fleet three times the size of his own, in position, ready to do battle. I have to think that he wondered if this was a doomed defense, or maybe he didn't wonder that, and maybe he had a solid strategy already worked out in his mind, so confident of his wooden wall approach that he knew the Greek fleet at Artemisium would succeed. Regardless of what Themistocles felt in his heart, the question still stood as the Greek fleet was at Artemisium, and these are questions, along with many others, that we will tackle next time on the Maritime History Podcast. In that next episode, we're going to focus exclusively on the tactics that were used in the engagements that make up this naval battle of Artemisium. We will consider the way that combat played out, the capabilities of the ships and their commanders. We'll even consider some of the spy craft and other psychological elements that Themistocles brought to bear during and even after the conflict. So I think it'll be hopefully another great episode. I really appreciate you all sticking around with the podcast today and in the long run as well. I mentioned on our temporarily available member episode about clipper ships, um, I've been struggling with some personal health issues lately. Things do seem to be looking up there though, and I'm really aiming to get the episode frequency up, especially in this new year. I'd like to get things on a more consistent schedule, hopefully even better than it has ever been in the past, if I'm being frank. At this stage, I'm long overdue for some shoutouts to our recent reviewers, and then I want to thank some of our crew members after that. So, thank you to our most recent podcast reviews from Joel, not the prophet. Um, I'm glad you clarified that, Joel. Uh, another review from Solitare Pox. Another review from Hodor the Triumphant. I like that name. And finally, from Dorian the Landlubber. Dorian, I feel your pain so much, as I too am currently a landlubber far removed from any whiff of ocean air. There is just something about the ocean, isn't there? Thank you again, guys, for your reviews. Additional thanks goes out to everyone that has been kind enough to send donations or to become supporting crew members. Some of that support recently went to renewing the hosting space for the podcast's website and for the audio files that you access to listen to this podcast. So that support is super helpful to keeping things afloat. I also invest your support into obtaining unique or obscure source material to hopefully increase the usefulness of the podcast and to hopefully make things a little more unique than you might find in any other podcast out there. Now that we're past the first of the year, I will be sitting down to mail out some stickers and other goodies to supporters as well, so if you're interested in getting in on that, do get in touch. All that as it is, a hearty thank you to the following new supporters. We have Maurizio, Sundar, Don, Merrick, Jesse, Christina, Hakim, Rachel, Jonathan, and John. The support is really humbling, as it has been all along. And I did just think of one additional thing um, I've been able to begin doing thanks to your support, and I mentioned it earlier on, but that is to create custom maps for our episodes. In the past, I've been stuck using whatever maps were available online, many times maps from Wikipedia. These are usually good and useful but they don't always focus on what we're discussing specifically. Sometimes they include way too much information. Sometimes they don't include enough. So I've purchased a program to help me create maps that are a bit more customized to our discussion, and the first one of those will be used for this discussion of Artemisium. Check it out on the show notes. Let me know any thoughts on how it turned out, if you would like to do so. All right. 
As I say, next time we will dive right back into where we left off with the respective Greek and Persian fleets beached on the shores of Artemisium and Aphetai, separated by a mere ten miles of water, ready to do battle. I think you'll be surprised how the battle plays out if you're unfamiliar with it, so I hope you'll join us next time for that discussion. All right, crew. Fair winds and following seas. And as always, thanks for listening to the Maritime History Podcast. <laughs>